some people think of a cut as making a horizontal cut and then an anterior vertical cut. But what we're going to do with the reciprocating saw is make a more gentle S-shaped curve. And the initial cut at the top is actually going to be more in a downward direction than a lateral direction. So here we're starting the cut back into the retrolingular depression keeping the saw relatively deep but above the inferior alveolar nerve and now we're going to gently come down and parallel that outer cortex so that the proximal segment will essentially be the thickness of the lateral cortex of the ramus of the mandible and here we're going to extend that cut down just paralleling the outer surface of the mandible now the most important aspect of a sagittal osteotomy is to get a good cut at the anterior inferior border area and so we want to get very good exposure in this area and here we're placing the channel retractor subperiosteally essentially near the posterior aspect of the anagonial notch and sometimes if it's difficult to visualize this area it helps to take the bite block out or pull it slightly forward so that the mouth will close a little bit giving you a little bit more generous exposure to the anterior inferior border of the mandible. What we essentially want to do here is to again create a soft curve from the inferior border up the lateral aspect connecting it with the previous osteotomy. So we're creating some room with the channel retractor and we're starting the saw at the inferior border and we're cutting just through the lateral cortex to avoid damage to the nerve in this area and we're going to gently curve this back towards the inferior aspect of the vertical osteotomy that we previously created. And then it's often easier to connect these by coming back to the top and putting the saw in and moving from the top down. Now, in many cases you can actually look through the osteotomy into the channel retractor and you can visualize to be sure that you've made the cut completely through the inferior border of the mandible and once all of these cuts are connected the osteotomy should essentially be complete and once the bony cuts have been completed there are several different ways to separate the osteotomy what we advocate is taking a small thin osteotome and just very gently tapping it in the mid portion of the osteotomy. We don't want to put a lot of pressure up too high as this will occasionally result in a lingual segment fracture. But here we're just tapping the osteotome in to begin to get some initial separation at the top of the osteotomy. And then we're going to tap the osteotome in a little further down and actually use it to lever against the posterior body of the mandible to push the proximal segment laterally. And we're working our way down to the inferior border where the bone is the thickest. Now, again, there are several ways that the separation can be completed. One way would be to take a slightly bigger osteotome and just tap it gently into the osteotomy site and then again use that as a lever to help pry the proximal segment away from the distal segment. Now we're not using this osteotome to fracture the osteotomy but simply to tap it in to use it to help lever the area. Here we're using a wedge and in the same fashion, we're just getting it into the osteotomy site at the inferior border where the bone is strongest and we're moving the proximal segment laterally to get separation and we're looking at the entire osteotomy site to make sure that the separation is going as planned. Now what sometimes happens, as you see here, is the inferior alveolar nerve will get hung up in the proximal segment. And to free that, uh, sometimes some bone can be removed with a rongeur, occasionally with a, an osteotome, and often just with an instrument like a freer or a Woodson elevator. The bony shell over the inferior alveolar canal can be peeled off, and as you see here, we're just gradually teasing the nerve out of the canal, moving superiorly up the proximal segment until we have the uh, nerve completely freed and uh, removed from the proximal segment.
Now we're going to put a J stripper down into the area of the antigonial notch where the channel retractor was and we're going to move this superiorly to remove the posterior periosteal and muscular attachments as well as some of the medial pterygoid attachments and occasionally you'll see a small fragment of bone that uh, we're going to remove here. While we have this J stripper in place we can put a little anterior pressure on the mandible to help relieve some of the tension from the periosteal sling and develop some very passive mobility and we can also expose the anterior aspect of the distal segment and look all the way up to the superior segment to make sure that the split has occurred just as we have designed it. And then we're going to take the proximal segment we want to manipulate it to make sure that we have good mobility and this will also help us to develop a feel for the condylar position that is going to be important at the time that we seat the proximal segment for fixation. And here the patient's in maxillomandibular fixation and we're going to begin the rigid fixation using a technique involving three screws. Now when we make the stab incision we want to place the scalpel blade through the skin and then we want to extend it an extra millimeter or two. If you make a true stab incision only the width of the scalpel blade when you put the trocar in the edge of the trocar will often tear or bruise up the margins of the small incision. We're going to push the trocar through and aim it slightly upward so that it'll be easy to identify the end, remove the obturator, and then place the cheek retractor. It should be done at an appropriate angle so that you have good retraction of soft tissue as well as good exposure to the entire lateral aspect of the ramus where the screws are going to be placed. Here we're going through the trocar and we're going to place two 2.0 millimeter holes in the lateral cortex. There are several methods for positioning the proximal segment and seating the condyle. The main objective is to get the condyle superiorly seated into the fossa. And so to achieve this, we're going to uh, put some upward pressure at the angle of the mandible and make sure we have good inferior border alignment. And while we're doing that, we're trying to put a little bit of upward and backward pressure on the proximal segment here using a wire director or gauze packer. And while that's being held in position, we'll then use the second hole that we drilled and using a 1.5 millimeter drill and a lag screw technique, we're going to go through and uh, drill through the inner cortex or the medial cortex. And then we're going to place a screw and we'll talk about determining the depth uh, in just a minute, but for the purposes of the demonstration, we're using a 12 millimeter screw. And the main thing is to try to keep the angles all the same. So when you're drilling with the drill and then reinserting the screw and the screwdriver, the angle needs to be kept the same so that everything will maintain good alignment. The third screw we'll place will be a bicortical or a position screw. And so the holes drilled in both the outer cortex and the medial cortex will be done with a 1.5 millimeter drill so that when the screw is put in place it will actually engage both the lateral and the medial cortex. There are several different combinations of patterns that can be used. Here we've used three screws in a row at the superior border. You could do two at the superior border and one at the inferior border or an inverted L. The main thing is to find a good bone thickness away from the dentition or the inferior alveolar nerve. And here you can see we're checking the stability of the fixation.